I, I will say, I think a lot of times they're, they're overpriced. And the problem with buying pockets is that you as a buyer, you have no power. You know, the win is that, uh, you know, you get the place before it hits the market. The loss is usually you pay a little bit more for it and you have no rights. You know, you can't really ask for anything in inspection. If your mortgage contingency is running behind, they may cancel the deal on you. You know, and I get a lot of clients to get frustrated with them. And I said, well, listen, the, the real win here is the fact that you got it. That's it. This is Laracy Live, and I'm your host, Matt Laracy, giving you unfiltered access to the world of real estate. We cover market trends, news, and give you the honest answers that will keep you ahead of the real estate game. Literacy Live is brought to you by Zenlist. Do you want to know the secret to growing a high volume real estate business? It's not just about generating the most leads. The key to success for Literacy's agents is providing the best client experience. We put our clients on Zenlist because we know that they're getting the modern mobile experience they not only want, but expect from their agent in this day and age. Using Zenless with our clients put us all together in a shared space where we could work together during the home search process, which helps us be efficient and provides our clients the VIP treatment. Sign up for Zenless using code Literacy Live, no spaces, all lowercase, to save $240 on your first year's subscription. Literacy Live is also brought to you by Lincoln Title. Lincoln Title is the best and most efficient title company in Chicago and the best place to close your property. Okay, so today we are talking about what you need to know if you are buying in 2023. So what we did is we put together a lot of questions of what our clients have been asking of us and we asked a lot of our clients, what would they like to know? So we go ahead and uh, put this together and our first question is, what is my first step if I'm looking to buy? Well, I'd say the first step is to, you know, interview a couple of realtors see which one you think is going to do the best job for you, talk to a lender, see how much money you can get, uh, and then kind of move forward from there. How many realtors should I interview? Um, it's up to you. Uh, I know a lot of people do one to three. I mean, if you do more than three, I, I personally, I think it's aggressive. I would only do that if you felt uh, the three uh, you talked to wouldn't do the best job. But I mean, just, you know, see what the people's experience is, et cetera. I, I, I don't think it's probably the the best move if you're going to buy your first place and you're working with a realtor who's never sold a place before. It's probably not the, the, the greatest, but I would definitely, uh, you know, talk to a few different people, in my opinion, three max. Uh, how many lenders should I talk to? Um, I would talk to a couple, get a few different opinions, make sure you're not getting misled. Uh, it's not all just about rates. It's about what kind of cost you have as well. Um, so I would definitely look into a few different avenues to see, you know, uh, what the lenders can offer you and what would be the best fit. Um, should I worry about rate shopping right now? You don't really want to shop your rate until you're under contract because the rate's going to change from now and when you go under contract. So the reality is, is, you know, hook up with a couple lenders right now, get a few people that you think you're going to want to do a loan with. Then when you go under contract, re-engage those lenders again and see which one uh, gets you the best deal that also makes you feel the most comfortable. So, you know, a lot of guys will just drop their pants and give you the best price, but they're not going to close the loan and not going to do it right too. So that's something you have to kind of keep in mind. With everyone's fear increasing with mortgage rates, where are some ways buyers can help themselves get a lower rate? I mean, in all honesty, just talk to some people and make sure that you have good credit. I mean, if you have good credit and you put more money down, you'll get a better rate. Uh, but essentially, like, it's not like one guy is going to be at like 6% and the other guy is going to be at 3%. I mean, there's going to be not huge differences between them all. Uh, what is a pocket listing? So at the busy season, front part of the year, first six months or so, uh, you're going to see more pocket listings hit. Uh, and those are listings that, uh, you know, are not on the market, but coming soon to the market. Personally, I don't see the point of doing a pocket listing, especially during busy season. If you got a run of the mill property under a million bucks, uh, we're in sales. So the more people who see it, the more, uh, you know, likely you are to sell at a better price. But uh, there are a lot of people who are going to sell in the pockets or privates, whichever terminology you want to use. So, you you know, uh, even though I don't like them, a lot of people sell them that way. And you as a buyer, you want to make sure that you have access to it. Uh, so make sure you're working with an agent that's connected. I mean, uh, obviously, we use Zenless. Shout out to Zenless. They, they sponsor us here. Uh, Zenless has uh, the most pocket listings on there. TAN is also another site. Now, Private MLS has some too. Um, are pocket listings generally overpriced? 
I, I think a lot of times, I know a lot of times people are like, well, you know, if you want X price, like I think it's high, but what we could do is go in the pockets and see if it works. And if not, uh, you know, we can then lower the, uh, the price once we go on the market. So I, I will say, I think a lot of times they're, they're overpriced. And the problem with buying pockets is that you as a buyer, you have no power. You know, the win is that, uh, you know, you get the place before it hits the market. The loss is usually you pay a little bit more for it and you have no rights. You know, you can't really ask for anything in inspection. If your mortgage contingency is running behind, they may cancel the deal on you. You know, and I get a lot of clients to get frustrated with them. And I said, well, listen, the, the real win here is the fact that you got it. That's it. Do you think with an economic recession looming, there will be an increase in foreclosures or short sales and provide opportunities for investors? Sure. I think in certain sectors of the market, I think in growing communities that maybe grew too much during the last three years that went up in value, we're probably going to see those areas kind of take a hit. And I think it's possible that the job market's been overinflated and that some people will be able to miss payments. And then that way that's going to fall into the category of people missing payments going into foreclosures and short sales. In the markets that we work, which are the downtown markets, we've just had three of the worst years in history. I don't see us going into foreclosures or short sales. I don't think we're going to to see a, a big boom of those in the markets I work. I wouldn't be surprised if in some areas we see a little bit more of those, but we're not heading towards like in, you know, nine to 12 territory where like 50 to 60% of the inventory was for uh, foreclosures or short sales. Is it worth waiting out rates coming down and renting? No, I mean, rents are an all time high, so it doesn't really make sense to, you know, spend an all time high for rents. And at the same time, you know, rates are rates. Average American interest rate is six and a half percent. They just dropped. They're like hovering around like five, nine ish. I mean, by the time this podcast comes out, who knows? Maybe they'll go up or down. But the reality is, is that don't try to time the rate. Buy the place when you want to buy it. And if the rates drop, refinance later. It is what it is. A lot of, a lot of, you know, lenders are offering free, you know, refis after a year. I mean, technically speaking, in Illinois, everybody gets a free refi, but you have to pay a quarter point higher. Uh, but the reality is some, some are giving you the best rate possible uh, for free. So that's something, another thing when we talk about interviewing lenders, talking about the refi pers uh, possibilities. Um, did we reach the low for the downtown market yet? Yeah. I think we bottomed and we're, we're now in the uh, road to recovery. I mean, you know, we're entering this year anywhere from 3.1 to 5.1 months of inventory in the downtown markets, which is the lowest amount of inventory we've seen since 2019. So we're definitely seeing a better market. In fact, you know, this is the second week of January that we're shooting this. It'll probably come out in the third week of January, but we are seeing more movement on our downtown listings than we have in years past, specifically in, you know, under a million dollar range. Um, we're seeing property sell with multiple bids in River North, Streeterville, and Gold Coast, which I've, I've haven't seen in the front part of the year in three years. Uh, so my theory that, you know, people would be going back to work and that these markets would be hotter. I mean, we're, we're seeing it firsthand. So I, I think we're in road recovery to balance phase at this point. Uh, why have rentals be, uh, been so heavy in the last year and will they level out? I don't think so. I, in fact, I think rentals are going to get hotter. I mean, they've been heavy because a lot of people have been second guessing whether or not they're going to go back to work. So you, you got a lot of people got transferred here for, for work, you know, the hybrid. And some people are like, was well, this here to stay? Or like, will we go back to lockdown? Uh, is the crime as bad as everybody says it is? What am I really going to be doing, you know, in the next three to five years? So there's just a lot of uncertainty in people's lives in the economy. So people are deciding to rent. Uh, rather than buy. And that's why the rental market's been so hot. What we're going to see come up here soon is when the recession hits, typically speaking, generally, we see rents go up because then less people buy even more. So I think the rental market's only just begun. I think the rental market's going to be even hotter. Will crime deter buyers away from downtown markets? Yeah. I mean, crime's been bad. Um, it's been bad in all big cities. Uh, we're not the only ones having it. Uh, I mean, I, I am involved with the Chicago Police Board, and I can tell you that uh, uh, looking at the stats that we've been getting, uh, technically speaking, crime is down, uh, although the media makes it seem like it's much higher. And uh, even though crime is down 2022 than it was in 2021, uh, there are certain parts of crime that are way up, like carjackings are way up and, you know, muggings and stuff like that. So, and on top of that, even though crime is down in 2022 from 2021, it's still way up from like 17, 18, and 19. So, you know, we got a long ways to go there, and um, I, I I, think it's getting better, and I think the main thing is that people are kind of sick of it, and, you know, in 2020 and 2021, people didn't really care about it. Now people are kind of sick of it, so I think it's only going to get better from now, but it, it has been a problem, a big problem for the downtown market specifically because people just haven't uh, felt it, it, that they could buy down there because they, they weren't sure if they'd feel safe walking around, which, is, which has been a struggle. Um, will the suburb market soften this year? I think so. I, I think it's 
I, I don't think it's going to be like a, a, a bad market suburbs. I don't think it's going to be as good as it's been. I've, I've never seen the suburb market hot. I started selling in my career in the suburbs. I, I hate it because it sat so long. You'd see places sit for years. It would go through five or six different agents and then it would finally sell. And then all of a sudden, in the last two to three years, you get a property, go on the market for 400000 sell it 600000 first day. It just doesn't make sense. I'm telling you guys, when, when things stop making sense, that's when you know things are going to change. And that's kind of where we've been the last few years. So I don't care what anybody tells me. I mean, the suburb market's never going to last. Maybe it's this year cools off. Maybe it's next year. But this, uh, you know, one and done, you know, one showing and, you know, 15 offers uh, in the suburbs, that's, that, that's coming to an end. And I'm seeing across the country, the stats have been in the last quarter that their sales are down and you're seeing like mass layoff happens and, and uh, big uh, real estate companies. So it's the, t the time is coming. They've peaked and now they're, they're, they're dropping. I'm not saying they're dropping pricing, but their sales are going to start dropping and you're going to start seeing a different market out there. How much can you negotiate off list price? It's all relative. I get people all the time. Well, I heard you could get 96.5% of, of list or, you know, it's, it's uh, natural to offer 5%. I mean, honestly, I don't know if they do that in other states, but I, I hear these numbers all the time. And I don't know if there's like, if you Google it, it comes up, but I'll tell you right now, there's no kind of set guidelines what you can do. You know, sometimes a place comes on at 500000 like it's worth five twenty five, and they underprice it get multiple bids. Sometimes a place comes on at 500000 it's worth four fifty. I'm like, I don't know what the guy was doing coming on the market at this. But the reality is, is that the only way to talk about how much you can negotiate off this price is by looking at the comps and working with an experienced agent that can tell you whether or not you're overpaying or underpaying for the property. How do you determine value on listings? We look at comps. We don't do price per square foot in Chicago. We're only only big uh, civilized cities in the country that does not do price per square foot. There are no guidelines. Most agents walk into the unit, look around, and you know make up an arbitrary number to tell you what the square footage is. But we base every single price off of comparable units, which are similar units that have sold recently. If you're in a high rise, the tier is the best comp. A tier is whatever it ends in. So like you know 406 is an 06 tier. So 506, 606, 706, 806, etc. is going to be the same. It's the same footprint now. Of course, some buildings change, okay, but generally speaking, that's how it is. And if you're looking at a two bed, two bath in that building, that would be the second best comp. If you're looking in like a Lincoln Park or a Lakeview, you'd be looking at like duplex downs or duplex ups. You'd only be looking at that certain kind when you do it. And of course, with single family homes, you can look at other single family homes and you can look at, you know, things that uh, have factors to it. Like, are they the same lot size? What is the year built? What kind of upgrades have they got done in there, et cetera? Um, what are some listings? Why are some listings square foot not displayed? We just talked about it. Just again, guys, uh, never bring up square footage to me. You should never bring up square footage in Chicago because literally everybody makes it up. So what a lot of realtors do, and I do this on most of my listings, I just put zero because it's. I, I don't want somebody later on being like, well, you told me it's 1,200. We measured it's 1,000. You know, most people not only would just make it up, but they'll also just look at the last MLS and be like, I don't know, last guy listed at 1,200, so I'm going to list at 1,200. <laughs> are we seeing more first-time home buyers in 2023 since rents are high? We are. We're seeing more people buy for the first time downtown specifically, not only because rents are so high and it's becoming cheaper to buy than it is to rent, but we're also seeing it because instead of the people leaving the city and going to the suburbs or going to Idaho or like Nebraska because they could you know, live in the cornfields and work, we're seeing first time buyers come to the city from like the Ohio's and Minnesota's and cities, uh, states like that, because they're getting relocated here because they're taking their first job and they're buying their first place as a result. That is something we have not seen in the past three years. And I will tell you right now, the rise of the first time buyer in the downtown market, it's going to be huge. So while the rest of America is going to start softening up because they have higher inventory and lower demand, we big cities, places specifically like Chicago that got absolutely decimated the last three years, we are seeing all different types of buyers that we have not seen, and that's going to keep our market strong. And in fact, I, I, I really think we're going to have a gangbuster year. I do. Our condos fully back yet? Are we still seeing uh, more people work from home? And we kind of talk, touch on this, but I'm seeing less people work from home. I'm seeing a lot, and, and th there's something, you know, I represent the most buyers in the state, and I have now for quite some time, and every single buyer consultation I've done so far this year, buyers are saying like, hey, right now we're working hybrid, but most of our employers said that 2022 is kind of like the last of it, and they're really kind of forcing us to come back to the office. So I, I think the back to work is, is starting to end. We're still anywhere from 40 to 45% of people back in the office full time, but that is changing. Uh, is the migration of workers moving to Chicago going to be back in 2023? I think it's going to be better back. I think we'll be fully back by 2025, let's call it. 
Uh, but, you know, for sure, it's getting better. Uh, when can, uh, can I get a deal? Back half of the year. August to December, you'll get a deal. First six months, no chance you're getting a deal. Uh, our lock box boxes used in Chicago. This is a big one, guys. So, you know, you're looking to buy your first place. You give me a list of 20 and tell me you want to get in there in like, you know, two seconds. We don't use lock boxes for the most part in the markets that we work. I mean, Chicago is a big place. We work a small spec sector of it. But when we look for properties in the city, it's always us and the listing agent present. So the listing agent is always present for all showing. So we do not use lock boxes that much in Chicago. Why is it when I click on a button on Redfin or Zillow, I get a realtor? Uh, if I tour with them, do I need to use them? So this is a big thing, guys. So if you're looking to buy your first place and you go on one of these, you know, mainstream websites and you click on a button, uh, they're going to direct you to an agent who then is going to be somebody that you could talk to for information on the property. They are not, they are not, they are not the listing agent. Okay. They're just a random local agent. Okay. And then they would show you the property. Now, we have procuring cause in the state of Illinois, which means that the person who shows you the property has the right to you on that property. So if you tour with that person, they would be the one getting commission, even if you have another realtor. That's the way it works. Now, your realtor can make a case for it and try to get it, and then you can say you're misled. But the reality is that person took time another day. They showed it to you, so they have the right to you. So if you're looking to buy a property and you have a realtor, just go back to them. But if you click on one of these sites, you're going to be thrown to a random agent. Full disclosure, we're a partner with Zillow. So, I mean, I love the fact that when you click on these things and you come to us, but the reality is, is that like, if you got somebody and you like them, make sure you just send it to them rather than just kind of be touring on your own. Um, do places, oh, rent first buy in 2023. I mean, I, I, I always think the best time to buy is, you know, buy, buy when you feel comfortable. I never see any point of renting. I love people to rent because, you know, I own a bunch of properties and just pays my bills and I just get free money thrown to me. But, you know, every landlord out there, they have the same mentality. So if you rent, you're just pretty much giving your cash to somebody else. That's all. So no matter what, rent first buy, always buy. Do places that don't have rent cap, uh, caps appreciate better than ones that don't? Uh, yeah. So pre-recession, pre-2008, I feel like buildings that didn't have rent caps uh, were worse. Like people didn't want to live around people um, who were renting. So that the, like buildings with rent caps uh, or buildings that didn't have rent caps, people kind of frowned upon. They're like, no, I don't want a lot of renters here. Get them out of here. Like, I don't want to look at that building. Now, they're specifically people under the age of 35 years old, they want buildings where they can have the flexibility of being able to rent because everybody thinks they want to be uh, a landlord until they become a landlord and all the laws in Illinois protect the tenant. So majority of people who buy into these buildings who don't have rent caps and like, man, I want to be a landlord. Then they rent it. And after the first year, like I wasn't built to be a landlord. And like I told you, you wouldn't want to do it, but it doesn't matter. It's all facade. And uh, you know, people like the perception. The perception is, is that if you can be able to rent it, these people think they're going to have more flexibility. So they may be, want to be able to rent it in the future. So those buildings trade for more money than buildings without rent caps. Now there is an exclusion on that. If you're buying a property above a million dollars, pretty much every building above a million dollars has a rent cap. You would never make any money off those anyways. And typically they're not really at the rent caps because people don't buy there to rent. But for your more entry level or step up buildings, buildings with rent caps tend to trade a little bit lower. When's the best time to list? January, February. Uh, this is more for buyers, but the question's here, January, February. That's when the least amount of inventory is on the market. What are the more, most important thing to look for in a place? Location. Location, location, location. Always location. I always tell people look for location first, building second, unit third. If you're in a good location and a well-ran building, you got a favorable layout, you'll be able to sell that for the most money later. Are high rises or small buildings better? Uh, it's all personal trait, uh, or, or I'm sorry, personal decision. You know, small buildings are great because you have lower assessments, you have lower, lower overhead, but you have more costs. You have more maintenance, meaning that like you have to be involved. The problem with lower, uh, smaller buildings is that everybody has that let George do it mentality, meaning that they think everybody else is going to do it. And then something breaks and they got to come out of pocket. So they're more prone to have special assessments, but your bill monthly is much lower. Uh, my best advice to you is if you buy into a small building, auto draft a hundred bucks away a month, keep it in a separate savings account and you kind of have your own reserves kind of built up. Now, high rises are great because they're really well ran. They have really detailed minutes. Everything's great. If you're type A personality, like these things are ran like a machine. The downside with them is that you pay for it. They have high assessments. And if you get a bad board who continues to raise assessments, it can devalue the property. Ways to get out of a lease. If I find a place I love, you know, money, uh, sublease your property, 
uh, off your landlord, uh, like that they could show it for free uh, and that you'll be on the hook until they rent it out. Uh, be nice. You know, that's the main thing. Be nice and just be reasonable. Be like, listen, like if you make your landlord whole and be like, listen, this is not going to cost you any difference and I'll make sure it's on like the prime rent cycle. Typically speaking, they'll let you out, but it's hard to get out of a lease if like it's October and you're like, well, I'll find a lease for 12 months. Like, well, nobody wants an October to October lease. But if you're in prime selling season, like February to July, let's call it, and you want to make your landlord hold, uh, I'm sorry, hold, like you just got to be nice about it. And, you know, you might have to throw a couple bucks at it. Um, will buyers have more power this spring? I think in certain sectors of the market, they will. You're buying a property above $2 million, uh, you know, for a single family home. I think that market's going to be softer. Uh, I think if you're buying, uh, you know, $2 million plus high rise, that market will be softer. But I think that two to $600,000 property, I'll tell you right now, let's say two to $750,000 property. I'll tell you right now, your power is going to be negative. You're going to see a complete and utter different market than we saw from the end of the third quarter and fourth quarter. Uh, what is a reserve? That's a good question. So for buyers out there, you're buying into a condo. Uh, every building has HOA dues or assessments. Uh, we call them assessments here. Part of your assessments are put towards an operating budget and reserve fund. Your reserves are your savings account for the building. So think of a reserve like your savings. When you don't have enough money in that savings and they got to redo the hallways or do the roof or something like that, you have what we call special assessment. A special assessment is a one-time fee to pay for a big capital expenditure. Every building, guys, every single building you've ever known in your entire life will probably have a special at some point. Shit breaks. So if you get a buddy that tells you, like, you should never buy into a building that has a special, you should be like, well, listen, you don't know what you're doing because they're going to have them. The thing is, if there's a special every year, that's a problem. If there's a special once every, like, you know, eight to ten years, it is what it is. What is the standard lot size in Chicago? 25 by 125. So if you're buying a single family home, 25 by 125. If you're looking at three to four unit walk up buildings and you wonder why they don't have a garage, uh, that's probably because they're on a 24 foot lot. So if you've got three units and you're in a 24 foot lot, you can't build a garage. That's why they have carports or they're just exterior parking. That's a great way to tell. If you're like, why, uh, Matt, I'm looking online and I feel like the inside of this feels a little bit more narrow, lot size. Uh, what do you think downtown market will return to pre-pandemic conditions, demand, days on market, et cetera, 2025? I think 2025 will be fully back. I think this year is going to be a very strong year. I think 2024 will be pretty much back to normal, and 2025 will be crushing it. Um, are inspections worth the price? Uh, yes. I mean, if you're buying a single-family home and you don't do an inspection, you're an idiot. Like, I, I'm sorry. Like, I don't care if you took it as is, still do an inspection just so you know for your own sake. But, like, who who the hell knows what could be there? If you're buying, like, a studio condo in a high-rise, I mean, I, it's debatable. It really is. I mean, like, there's only so much that could go wrong in four walls. But the reality is the cost of an inspection on a condo, guys, is so low. Let's call it, like, even for, like, a, a 1,400 square foot, it's, like, four to 500 bucks, like, it's like an insurance policy. Like, do you need car insurance? I mean, tech, well, technically you do, but like, you know, you don't need insurance on all this stuff. Like, is it smart to drive around without it? I, I don't know. I don't think it's worth the risk. So if it was me, I would always do an inspection. Uh, although I'll be a hypocrite. I didn't, I didn't do an inspection my last place. But reality is, is that like, you know, it, it, would be, it would be almost foolish not to spend a couple bucks to see what's wrong with it. Um, when do you think the downtown, we got that. Do you see the uh, in-town market coming back uh, at the moment, it's huge. The Intel market is, is big, big, big. Listen, we, we've been kind of through COVID for two years now. You know, 2021 and 2022, we're, we're kind of it's kind of over at this point. I'm not saying people don't respect it. You're not seeing people getting sick. But I, I, you're not seeing people as fearful. Let, let me put it this way. The mass is not as fearful anymore, which means that now people are starting to get bored. I've been telling this to people forever is that we are creatures of habit, okay? It's been two years of people just eating at Applebee's and they want to come back downtown and experience real life again and see people. So that's why we've been literally crushing it with people buying properties either from out of state or from the suburbs. Biggest thing to look for when buying a single family home, I, I, to me, I would say lot size. I, I mean, I, I would rather have a, a good size lot. Uh, second thing, of, of course, actually, first thing should be location. Second thing should, should be um, lot size. And I think you should also look at like the quality of the construction. A lot of homes were built really poorly. You know, you can always change the kitchen or bathroom, but, you know, if you're on a small lot in a shit location, you got a poor foundation, like, what are we really doing? Um, how long uh, before I buy should I start looking at condos or properties? Uh, I would say that, like, you know, it takes about, on average, 45 days to close. You can usually identify a property within 30 days. So let's say, like, on a, on a grand scheme of things, 75 days out is is good. But I always tell people, you know, you want to give yourself a little bit of breathing room. So I would say, like, you know, 90 to 100 days out 
uh, from when you want to move is probably the best pro- time to start kind of like really pounding the pavement. It's never too early to get information, though, guys. When do you think uh, will happen if Soldier Field, if the Bears move to Arlington Heights? Who knows? I'm sure they'll make something else of it. There's always this fear stuff out there that like the world's going to end if something happens. I'm, I'm sure we'll figure it out. Um, I want to buy an investment property. Uh, what should I expect as cash flow? Uh, if you're getting a loan, you should expect negative cash flow. If you uh, are paying cash, you should respect, you know, expect anywhere from a 3 to 5% return on your investment, which is going to be lower than what you do if you just threw it in the S&P. But I'll tell you right now, it's going to have diverse uh, diversity in your money. So you know, if you want to get a couple properties and you're going to get a, you know, a bunch of money in the bank, it's not a bad idea. Uh, will HOA fees increase with rising inflations? All HOAs went up, anywhere from 2 to 10%. Uh, you know, The rise of costs is real, and in return, that's going to be directly reflective on the um, assessments. Do you think Chicago will ban Airbnb ever? No, but it's the least uh, Airbnb-friendly city in the country. How does parking uh, parking uh, work when it's asked uh, when they ask extra for it? So essentially, in Chicago, they always ask extra for parking. So if you see something at four hundred thousand plus thirty five, you have to buy the space. Now the price is negotiable, but buying it or not is usually not. So if it's four hundred plus thirty five in your head, you think the price is four thirty five, and you offer from there. It's a one loan, one offer. It's not two contracts. I always know I got a suburb agent when I get two contracts. I'm like, what are you doing here? Like it's one throw it on one contract. Uh, but yes, one loan, one offer, got to buy it. And remember, guys, fun fact, if it's a deeded parking space, you're going to have extra taxes and assessments, and those numbers are not included. Uh, what is the best month to buy? October, November, December. Um, but, you know, you also got the shittiest inventory. What do you expect uh, to happen to prices in the suburbs? I think they'll go down. I don't think they're going to, like, plummet, but I-, I think they've been inflated. What percentage of your deals are buyers asking for a rate buy down? Almost none right now. And in fact, I, I mean, I- we did a podcast before about it, so I'm not going to ruin it, but... I don't think rate buy downs are usually the best use of your money. I mean, look at rates were seven and a half percent in October. Uh, today they're down at like five eight. So if you spent a bunch of money buying down your rate, you already lost that money. You could have just refied and cost you nothing. Uh, what do you uh, look for when you purchase investment properties? Good cash flow. Uh, I I also look for you. You're either a cash flow investor or you're a long-term investor. I'm a long-term investor, so I buy for location. So if I think it's a good location, property's not going to kind of really. Uh, uh, cost me too much time and then it's going to um, be easy to rent out that's what I look for uh, desirable area I used to say pre-pandemic that like no matter what people are always going to want to live in big cities so I used to always buy like in the heart of the city last couple of years has been tough but I'll tell you even during the pandemic I never had a vacancy my rent's been easily going up so you know there's different ways to go about it but you just have to think of what kind of uh, uh, investor you are do I need an attorney? Uh, technically speaking, just like if you committed a crime, you, you can always represent yourself. Uh, but in the state of Illinois and Chicago specifically, you should have an attorney. You should have legal representation. Uh, again, it's like going back to the, uh, you know, getting an inspection. It's an insurance cost. You definitely want to do it, especially if you've never done it before. It's not, it's not a huge expense. Um, what do I need to know about taxes? They're high. They're complicated. Uh, work with your agent on it. We could, we're going to be doing another podcast solely focused on taxes, but just know that they're high. Um, are there concerns about crime and what the city is doing about it? Yeah, it's a big concern, but you know, um, we got a mayoral mayoral election, uh, coming up and that's going to, uh, be the, I I think that's going to be the hot and main topic from whoever finishes in the top three when they have some sort of like vote off or one off that they have. And, uh, you know, I really feel like we've kind of plateaued on that, but yeah, there are a lot of people who are concerned about that. How many areas is too many areas to look for? I always tell people I always know a renter from a buyer when they give me areas. So if you're like, hey, I want to live in the Gold Coast or River North, uh, let's see about Lincoln Park and Lakeview. My buddy bought in Logan Square. What about Westtown, Bucktown, Wicker Park? Oh, South Loop could be good. I've had a couple of buddies in Pilsen. And you know what? Let's look at Uptown and Rogers Park as well. That's when I always know that you're going to be a renter because the thing is, is that you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off and you can't focus. So listen, if you're starting day one and you give me all those areas, great. Within a couple of weeks, if you don't knock off half of those and then another half from there, you're a renter. Because all you're doing is you're chasing, uh, you're chasing kitchens and baths, and then you're going to tell me what you're going to be like. Well, I feel really overwhelmed. I don't feel like you're, I'm really know what I'm doing, or I'm getting direction. And I always tell people is that like, listen, you have so many areas. By the time you finally get to the place you want to go, it's already sold. And then when the next place comes up that same day, and we're on a 50 property tour in 15 different areas, those places sell. Focus. Focus in on where you want to live. Location is the most important thing. It's where you go to work. It's where you go out to play. It's how you get around in life. Don't tell me that you don't care where you live because that makes absolutely no sense. And I will tell you nine times out of 10, I've actually counted last year, 
nine times out of 10, people who give me too much, uh, too many areas end up renting every single time that that happens. Uh, what HOA amount is too high? I think it's reflective to the price point. You know, if you got a million dollar condo and you got $900 HOA, that's not that bad. If you got a $300,000 condo and you have a $900 HOA, that can take away from the price point. So it's all relative to the price, but there are there's a certain point where the price, uh, the HOA gets so high that it starts de- uh, devaluing the property. What are my thoughts on Roscoe Village this area uh, this year? I think it's going to be a hot market. I don't think it's going to be as hot as it was in 2020, uh, 2021 and 2022. I think it'll still be a good market and it'll still go up a little bit in value, albeit not as much as it has in the past. Will buyers continue to look for more outdoor space? Yeah, um, outdoor space has always been popular. I do not think it will be as meaningful. I will tell you right now, I think more people are going to ask for public transportation. I haven't heard of that in the last three years. Pre-pandemic, it was the number one on every person's list. In the last three years, it's been not even on people's list, but I think that's going to be huge. Uh, which neighborhood outside of the true and tested neighborhoods do you think will see growth? I think the heart of the city is going to see growth. It's been it's been the worst the last three years, so I think there's only upside from here. If buyers have cash, would you uh, recommend updating units this year? Yeah, I mean prices have come down a little bit of of goods. I mean look at lumber prices, how much they've come come down. So yeah, if you like the place you're going to live there, do it for yourself. Will Michigan Avenue make a comeback? Yeah, I, I think it's going to get better. I mean it's 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 can't be much worse than it is now. I think there's, you know, big people at play trying to make things better. Is retail going to continue to go away from Michigan Avenue? I mean, I think it's possible. Uh, I think Michigan Avenue needs to reinvent itself. I, and, and you know what? I don't think this was just a pandemic thing. I think, you know, the way people shop for retail is, is has changed. You know, get more pop-ups in there. Get more kind of like, uh, you know, Instagram-worthy type of properties in there. Get more things that people can interact in up there. But I, I'm sure there's a lot of different ways to go. I mean, I don't have time to, you know, go to Michigan Avenue and tell people how to do it. But I think there's smart people over there that can figure it out. Are we going to see more or less inventory this year compared to last year? I think it's going to be different. You know, I think if you got the $2 million market in the single family homes, I think there'll be more. I think if you're looking at a two to $400,000 property, I think there'll be less. So I think it's all relative to what the price is. Will we ever see any appreciation in older uh, buildings that are along Michigan Avenue and uh, Lakeshore Drive? I think you'll see appreciation. Those things have been like literally like dropping big time the last couple of years. I think a lot of this pandemic related, but I mean, you would like to think that uh, they would go up. I think the biggest downside why those dropped so much from the pandemic is that like a large portion of people who buy those are honestly, they're older people who want an in-town unit and want to be able to look at the lake. And that market hasn't existed yet in the last three years. In fact, there's been like no market for that. So those really took a hit. And I think those are going to start coming back. Um, biggest things to look for when you're buying, we talked about that. Um, how will the Chicago mayor uh, elections affect the marketplace? I mean, honestly, I think it'll have a huge impact. I think the, 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 the general consumer that doesn't live in the city has a very negative outlook on the city. Uh, and I think for people, um, look at it and they look at management, right? So it'd be like any business. If you have a bad manager and the business is not doing as well, you fire the manager and replace them to see if they can turn around the business. And I think the average person's looking at the Chicago and like, hey, we got a bad manager. We need somebody else in there to help kind of like turn the ship around. So I think, yeah, I think if we get a, a different manager in charge, I think it'll definitely be better. Uh, and I think it's going to make the market better. Uh, if I'm looking to buy and be on my lease by June, when should I start looking? We talked talk about this. Honestly, if you can buy a place today and love it, but you got to eat two months of rent, or you buy a place in like May and you close and it lines up perfectly, but you kind of like it. Was it worth it? So I always tell people, it's like, honestly, just buy when you want to buy and deal with your lease later. The main thing is if you really, really like a place and it's worth eating a couple months of rent, do it. Can inflation also cause my assessments to go up if I buy a condo? We touched on that. If my credit isn't so good, but I'm ready to buy, what can I do to improve it? Talk to credit repair companies, talk to lenders. Lenders will put you in touch with the people to help improve your credit. What does literacy bring to the table versus the other 42,000 agents in Chicago? I mean, technically speaking, I think there's like 46,000 Chicago land, not just downtown. Uh, but I think we have the best systems in place, right? We got the best staff here, right, guys? We got the best staff? Yeah. All right. Um, they're all in here. They're smiling. They're happy. Look at this. They're giving chairs and throwing balloons up. Uh, but, I mean, we got the best staff. We have the best systems in place, meaning that we could get you in. Being organized is huge. Uh, one of the uh, big things uh, during busy season is being able to get into the property when you want to see it. We have the bandwidth to do it. 
So the fact that we're super organized to make sure that you get in the property when you want to see it. And then also understand the business, knowing the ins and outs, what to look for, what not to look for, what can appreciate, what can depreciate. Understanding like how the process works is huge. So we get you in, we give you the best advice you need. Then we negotiate you the best possible deal. And then when you go on a contract, most people are like, I don't know what the hell's happening. We have a whole process to make this extremely easy. We're color coded, we're checklisted out. Again, it's just having the right systems in place, but not only having the right systems, having the people who have the best experience. I've sold over 6,000 properties in my career, 6,000, okay? You cannot tell me anything that's happened that I have not seen before. I have literally seen everything you can ever imagine happen, the most messed up stuff. So I could tell you firsthand, if we run into a situation and be like, hey, this is what we have to do to get out of it or get into it, et cetera, not many people could do that. When you compare somebody like ourselves, when we do 6,000 deals compared to somebody who's done maybe 50 deals in a career, who do you think is going to have the most experience to make sure that you have the best experience? That's all. Anyways, that's all the questions we got. Best of look out there and the uh, best of uh, looking out there uh, in 2023. If you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks so much for listening to Literacy Live.